Good morning. It is a huge honor and privilege for me to be here, and I'll tell you a little bit about why in just a moment. Thank you, Mike. That was very generous. I always worry about those kind of introductions because I've discovered in my Christian walk that about the time you get your head a little bit bigger than your hat size, God is a way of reminding you who you are and who he is. So when you get built up, I'm always waiting for now what? Am I going to spill coffee in my computer? What am I going to do that will show that he's God and I'm not? I remember not so long ago being in school, secretary came on the intercom and said, RVL, everybody calls me RVL, RVL, your daughter's on line one. So I, Allison and I play little games back and forth anyway on, on these things and she's about nine, maybe ten. And I pick up the phone and I say, hello, this is the smartest man in the world. There's this long pause and this ten-year-old says, I must have the wrong number and hangs up. <laughs> and God said, don't forget who you were. Allison and I were traveling across New York State um, some time ago and we're just talking, father and daughter. She's my baby and my family. And um, a sign goes whipping past the car. It says Poughkeepsie. 20 miles. And I said, Allison, look at this. We're almost to Poughkeepsie. She looked at the sign and she said, Dad, it's Poughkeepsie. I said, Allison, I know that's how they spell it, but around here they say Poughkeepsie. Dad, if they wanted to say Poughkeepsie, they wouldn't spell it like that. So we went back and forth a few times on this. You can't tell a 12-year-old that she's wrong. So I thought, okay, first exit when we get to Poughkeepsie. We pull off. She now has a pretty good idea what's happening. Make a right, first right, first local establishment. I said, Allison, come on with me. Let's find out how they pronounce this place. Do I have to? Yes. So we walk in, I walk up to the counter, guy comes to the counter and I say, my daughter and I are having this disagreement about what you call this place. Could you please loudly and clearly tell me the name of the place where we are? He said, sure, Taco Bell. <laughs> and Allison looked at me like, dad, you're an idiot. And um, anyway, it's an honor for me to be here because I love, absolutely love an opportunity to interact with people like you. And by that, I mean three things. One, your age. That's my world. I'm a teacher at your level and somewhat below in terms of grade level. But that's the age the disciples were. I'm going to try and make a case for you today that the disciples Jesus picked were between ages 12 and 15. Most of you would have been too old already when Jesus came to have been chosen as one of the 12. And it just always hits me so hard walking into an audience like this to realize that if Jesus came to change the world, he wouldn't start with people like me. We're way beyond what it would take to mold us into his followers. He starts with people like you. And that's huge to me. Second, and I know you hear this probably more than once, you are the cream of the crop from God's point of view. You are people who know a lot about him, and I'm sure many of you, and I've not met you at all, with one gentleman's exception, um, you are people who have a fire inside of you for Jesus. Many of you do. That's huge. So many of the students I work with are still trying to decide where they stand with Jesus, and I bless God that they're trying to decide. But to walk in here, every time I've been here, it's just so alive with a passion for Jesus. The third thing is, I don't have to grade any papers, I don't have to give any homework, I can just come here and do what I love to do and there's absolutely nothing tagged on the end. So I bless God for that too. What I'd like to ask you to do is to stand, <clears throat> stand please if you would. If we were in a Jewish setting, in Jesus' day the disciples would have known this. Today if you go to a rabbinic setting you would do this. We'll just do a little piece of it. A Jew would say when you go to the text, which is what they call the Bible, you cannot ever go without being born again. Now that sounds like Christian jargon, it is not. It predates Jesus by 500 years. To them, being born again is to stand before God in the presence of witnesses, including Him, and say, God, this is where I stand with you, and I give you again my heart, my soul, my mind, my might, and I'm going to love you with every ounce I have inside of me. And God says, okay, then I'll speak to you. That's the Jewish mind. Say the Hebrew after me. Shema Israel. Shema Israel. Adonai Eloheinu. Adonai Adonai Echad. Say ch. Now say Echad. Now say the English after me. Hear, O Israel. The Lord is our God. The Lord alone. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Amen. I'll tell you honestly, that's awesome, but you're not Jewish, at least most of you. A Jew has a fire inside of him or her when they say these words. This is who I am. Nothing means more to me in the whole world than to want you to know and him to know that I want to love him with all my heart, with all my soul, and with all my might. And nothing is more central to who I am than that. And you can't say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Try the English with, after me. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Amen. Say these words after me, first from Isaiah. If I say, 
I will not mention him again or speak in his name. His word becomes a fire in my chest. I am weary of keeping it in. Indeed, I can't. And then from Paul, pray for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me that I may fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. Pray for me that I may declare it boldly as I know I should. These are the very words of God. Amen. Please sit down. That's how Jewish classes are opened in a rabbinic school. It's how Jesus and the disciples would have spent the beginning of their study. My wife said to me last night, so how are you feeling about this family institute? Actually, and, and I, I know this is hard for you probably to comprehend. I can't tell you how long ahead of time I look forward to this. This is so awesome. I've had such great experiences here because of people's passion for Jesus. So how are you doing about this thing? And I said, you know, I feel like a mosquito in a nudist camp. I know what I have to do, but where do you start? I have so much that I would love to share with you that I think, okay, that I think would be something that would be worth your processing. But it's huge because the Bible in its context is both content and method. And it's very difficult for a person like you or me, who are Western in our orientation, to step into the world of the East and to understand not only the content, but what's happening methodologically. My goal today will be to share with you the concept of what it means to be a disciple. Now that sounds typical religious jargon. I don't think you will find it that way. My goal is not to suggest that you're lacking something. My goal is to suggest that there's a model in the Bible that will enable you to live with a passion for Jesus and a commitment to God that's hard to find just in the Western approach to the text. Now, for me to do that, you need to give me a bit of time. There's a Jewish saying, you always build the foundation before you put the roof on. And I'd love to come and give you the roof because that's fun and it's powerful and it really hits you hard if Jesus matters, even if he doesn't. But we need to build a foundation. So if you'll go with me for a bit, I'd love to build a foundation and to show you how that foundation operates and then to move to what did it mean that Jesus came to be a rabbi first. Before he was Messiah, he came to be a rabbi and he called what in Hebrew you call, uh, pronounced Talmudim, disciples. I'll look at that a bit later. I've titled what I'll do today, In Rhythm with God. The Jewish idea is that God has a rhythm. Everything flows according to this wonderful harmonious rhythm. Everything from the seasons to the seven days of the week to how people are to relate to each other. And if you can find yourself in rhythm with God, it makes life turn into brilliant living color. If you live out of rhythm with God, whether it's your relationship, your career, your occupation, your family, I don't care what it is, if you're out of rhythm with God, everything looks gray and dark and hopeless. So that's the title. Within that, I'd like to talk about being in rhythm with God as a disciple. Now, I will talk nonstop from now to 4 o'clock, but that's not good because you have stuff. So you have to jump in. Do it Jewish style. Jewish style would simply be to get my attention and say it. You don't have to raise your hand. You, none of you will do that. You're way too Western and way too polite. You just say it. And if I don't notice you, you stand up. But you always preface it with the shtick. The shtick says, Rabbi, you are a wise and gracious man. Your reputation has... <laughs> Remember when they did that to Jesus? Rabbi, you were a wise and gracious man. All Israel has heard about you. May I ask you a question? That's exactly how you address a rabbi. 